Welcome to Eat Well, Travel Better, the Business of Food Travel podcast with Eric Wolf and Ashi Vale, where we help you become a better industry professional by gaining inspiration from some of the world's most successful people in the food and beverage tourism industry. With each episode, we meet these leaders and examine their secrets of success. We reveal the obstacles and challenges they have faced, along with their solutions and triumphs, and give you ideas and inspirations for many of the same business issues that you may be facing as well. And now for today's episode. Welcome. I'm Eric Wolf, and I'll be your host today for episode 31 of Eat Well, Travel Better, the Business of Food Travel podcast. And joining me today is co-host Ashi Vale. Today we'll be speaking with Heidi U. Spurl. While Heidi comes from a food service family, she didn't get into working in food herself until relatively recently. Heidi graduated with a degree in photography from art school in London. She then taught English in Rome and Tokyo, where she met her husband. They moved around a bit to Hong Kong and then back to Europe. It was hard being a trailing spouse, and Heidi needed some something that would fit into her family's schedule and also suit the needs of her children. She decided to pursue a master's in food policy, which provided a foundation to where she is now, working in food and sustainability. Welcome, Heidi. Hi, Heidi. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. We're really excited to speak with you today. Hi, Ashi. Thank you for having me and uh, to Eric as well. Well, why don't we start off with what inspired you to get into sustainable food and why you're doing it? Oh, that's a big question. I suppose it was very uh, natural. It was very much an organic process. I started um, working, actually, I was trained in photography and graphic design, and I also have taught English as a foreign language. So it's definitely not, um, you know, a long sort of 20 year career in food. I've been in food, in food sustainability, let's say, probably for the last eight or nine years. So it was really more of a second career move. And I think I would say it was my family that inspired me to move in this direction, having very young children and caring and being intrigued about, you know, how I could feed them well. So tell us a little bit more about that. You mentioned being in Boston and having to figure out a way to feed your kids in a healthy way. Yeah, that's right. So I had obviously other new mums around me at the time, as you do when you have kids. And I just recall them telling me very often that I had to read the food labels. I've got to look out for the hormones in the milk. These things that you just do not think about um, as a young mum, you're just trying to buy healthy food, um, get it done as quickly as possible. But I I suddenly had uh, people telling me about what they were doing. I'm reading the labels on high fructose corn syrup. So it was all very new to me. And I just didn't have this uh, knowledge before that. So it was really my peers that that was bringing this to my attention. And Heidi, after that, what uh, led you into Food Made Good? What was your journey? Um, There was quite a bit of time in between, for sure. When I was in Boston, that was probably around 2005, trying to get my kids to eat healthy was obviously the starting point. But then I started looking into uh, the difference between all the organic label standards in the States. It was very much different from in Europe, for example. And we had uh, lived in Boston for a couple of years and then moved over to Amsterdam. So in doing a lot of research, I started to understand, oh, as you move from country to country, the standards can be different. Uh, And that was just uh, one area that I was looking at. So I did find that in Europe, it was much easier to shop for just not just for my kids, but also for me and my family and my husband. In Europe, the standards were very much different, not just on um, organic standards, but being able to have access to foods, healthy foods, and for a good price. And things like having a farmer's market on your doorstep, I suppose. I guess it depends where you live. But in our case, in Amsterdam, I did find it a little bit easier We were also living in Brussels a couple of years later. After that, we've been moving around a lot. So the moving around a lot also helps you to really focus again because you have to start looking in the supermarkets again, uh, the different standards and the language and how it's all presented, whether it's through marketing or more formally. So that was very interesting. And then it was around the time we were living in um, Brussels, and that was probably about six years later that I found this incredible course called um, on food policy. And I started studying because it was tricky to find work, actually, moving every two or three years, having children, of course. So studying um, at a master's level was a great way to sort of take a bit of control back in my life and also do something I was really passionate about. So I did find this course, 
where I could do it distance uh, by distance learning. And that was the um, Masters in Food Policy in London. So by the time it was a two year uh, course and in year one, I started it in Brussels and in uh, year two, uh, we had moved to Amsterdam. So I started it in one city and finished it in another. And that was kind of typical of my life at the time. We were, I was very much a, what you call a trailing spouse, you know, following my, my partner around uh, in different, different parts of the world. So it was very hard in terms of settling down. Heidi, I wanted to learn a little bit more about how you got involved with Food Made Good and the Sustainable Restaurant Association. For our listeners, I met the SRA's director, Simon Hepner. Well, I met him a couple times, and most recently in London again last November. And I think the SRA is a really interesting business model, uh, something that is really needed in the world. So would you tell us a little bit more about how you found the organization and then a little bit more about what the organization does? Yeah, absolutely. So after having done all my studies, I found uh, some brief work with the Forum for the Future, another amazing NGO doing work in sustainability and in sustainable protein, sustainable nutrition, to be exact. And uh, the leader in that organization working on this space had read my dissertation and I started doing some work there. And through this short bit of work, if it was voluntary, I managed to do a project with the SRA And that was on a project called Future Plates and Future Chefs. So an incredibly interesting collaborative project. We worked with Forum. So it was Forum for the Future. We worked with the SRA and uh, the University of West London. So three organizations come together to collaborate on this space. And that is where I first sort of came into more physical contact and working together with the SRA. But however, of course, during my studies, I'd come across it as an organization. What I love about the program is that it takes a very holistic approach. Their framework underpins all of their work. So it's interdisciplinary by nature. They look at things from an environmental perspective, from a societal perspective, and sourcing is their third pillar. You can see it's very all-encompassing. And it's also a framework that's been you know, honed over the last 10 years, they, they've got this framework that's widely accepted now. And it started by, uh, well, they had a very good advisory board, and that was very important, leaning into sort of academics like Tara Garnett and, and Tim Lang. And then they also worked very closely with the single issue NGOs to try and understand the issues. So for example, if they were trying to design a toolkit for their members, because that's what it is. It's an association with members, sort of like what you have. They, they were designed these toolkits that were about the sing, single issues, such as cage-free eggs or sustainably sourced fish, high welfare meat. And you, we couldn't have, a single organization couldn't have all of the knowledge. So, so they leveraged it. They reached out to the Soil Association if they wanted to understand the issues around organic and versus conventional or they would reach out to WWF uh, UK in trying to understand what a healthy plate looks like for both human health and planetary health. So that was the strength really to collaborate with these NGOs, but not just NGOs, think tanks as well. More recently, the SRA has been working very closely with the World Resource Institute on um, the idea of decarbonizing menus. Um, And that's very exciting, you know, try to encapsulate what we're trying to do on the environment side and trying to connect the dots really for the chefs between climate and food. So that's the Sustainable Restaurant Association and then you have Food Made Good. So could you explain for our listeners how Food Made Good is, is that, is that a program of the SRA or how does that work exactly? Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. And it is it can be confusing. So the SRA stands for the Sustainable Restaurant Association. And they run quite a few programs and Food Made Good is just one of those. Uh, So it just made it easier to roll out in different cities or what they call territories. And uh, Food Made Good is the official auditing partner for the world's 50 best. I think that's been in place since 2013. So it really gives it that kind of sort of credibility uh, being aligned with some of these big foodie organizations that chefs know. Can you give us some examples of what make chefs and restaurateurs part of Food Made Good? Like what is there? What's part of the assessment? Is there a test? How how can they become members of Food Made Good? 
the core service is actually the ratings and it's what the chefs really love to do. They love to go from a bronze to a silver to a gold rating. And that's that sort of sticker you get in the window. And that's how they would communicate that they're working on sustainability with their diners. Kind of like when you have a delivery sticker in the window. That's one part. But uh, to support, you know, doing well in this rating, we have some other services, such as a digital online platform, which I think is really the gold dust for the members because they can come on and ask any question they want related to food and sustainability and we'll try to answer them or we'll probably leverage our contacts and, and ask, ask them, such as the NGOs or the think tanks or the academics. And that's what it's like at the beginning for Hong Kong anyway. We are the ones to answer the questions, but eventually we want the members to, to answer the questions amongst themselves. We don't just work with the food service providers, as in the restaurants. We also work with sustainable suppliers. So we try to connect the two. So you could be a restaurant looking for a sustainable fish supplier or you're looking for alternative packaging we connect these the suppliers and the restaurants to make their lives a little bit easier and uh, it also in supporting the rating we provide these toolkits and i think they're a really great way to illustrate what we do they're basically a one or two page up with advice on a particular topic so it could be increasing your veg and reducing your meat on your menu and it will be three or four sort of principles basically the research, the data, the facts. And then beneath that, we have some action points because what we do has to be practical and pragmatic. And so we offer that advice. These are the steps you can take if you wish to do the above. And that's sort of synthesized information from our research or the research of uh, what they're doing in the UK as well. So everything we do is supporting this rating program and the ratings is done um, as a self audit so the in order to scale we need the restaurants to do their part as well so they go through the audit and it's evidence checked so we check that we check all the the, the details if they say they're serving cage-free eggs well they'll have to upload you know a photo or, or an invoice from their supplier for example if they say they're serving sustainable fish they have to upload their MSC ASC certificate whatever it is so it's thoroughly thoroughly checked through and uh, and then they get a score and the wonderful thing about it is that this ratings is standardized so it's not shifting unlike um you have some sort of esg reporting and for corporates you, they sort of they tend to pick out what they want to report on where they're strong this rating is standardized across the three pillars so you're going to be sort of rating yourself on the same areas in the following year. So that's what I like. You benchmark yourself against the industry, but you can also set some targets and, and decide for yourself what areas you want to improve on uh, year after year. So, so that's the ratings. And the other thing that we do is um, some bespoke consultancy work. So if restaurants want us to go to them and uh, do some on-site audits or help them train their front of house, back of house staff to sort of work on a particular area, it could be um, how do you increase plant-based, um, how do you encourage, how do you nudge your, your diners to eat more, take, you know, take the healthier choice or opt for the the choice that has less environmental impact, but do it in a subtle way. So we do a lot of training and workshops, kind of sustainability 101, things like that. Heidi, you also mentioned that you find to be important that restaurants consider sourcing from smallholder farmers. Why is that important to you guys? The research shows that smallholder farmers take better care of the land. Uh, why is that important? What you have with sort of bigger farms is the idea of monocropping and monoculture, and it's shown to not be healthy for the soils. So what we found that when you support smaller farms, you support a healthier landscape environment. So the farmers are stewards of the lands, and uh, you're also supporting uh, the livelihood of these um, families rather than these kind of bigger corporations let's say so we're really going on what the evidence says uh, furthermore you know globally about 75 percent of uh, the world's farms are run and managed by smallholder farmers so we want to sort of help them keep keep that going april is food travel month join us every year on april 18th for world food travel day to celebrate traveling to experience culinary cultures and shortly after, on April 22 and 23, is our Online Food Travel Summit, the world's largest online food travel trade conference, taking place every April. 
Find out more about both on our website at worldfoodtravel.org. How many restaurants would you say are, you, are in your network right now? If you're talking about the UK, I think they have about 20,000 contacts, but I wouldn't say they're all restaurants. I think about under 1,000 over the last 10 years. Some come and go and then some come back. Um, you know, so I think they do have quite a large network. I know there were around eight or 900 present at last year's awards ceremony, which I forgot to mention, we do awards as well for our members because we spotlight the ones that are doing well. Um, in Hong Kong, we just launched. So uh, we are at 30 now. Uh, and we did launch in the middle of, you know, the whole protests and, and now the virus. So even in these circumstances, we've managed to bring in members. I think the need is re it really is there to, to, to set, get on this path and, and have an organization that can, that can help restaurants sort of understand the whole, the, all the issues. What is your goal for Food Made Good in Hong Kong? Is there a, a number of restaurants and members that you'd want to bring on? Uh, and what are the metrics for, for your success? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we um, had originally said um, about 5% of the 20,000 restaurants in Hong Kong within three years. So perhaps um, starting slow, about 100 in the first year, and then hoping through word of mouth that it really rockets up and, and we get more inbound inquiries due to awareness. But what we're finding is that there is a lot of education and awareness building that we will need to focus on in the first year. However, as I said earlier, uh, having worked with the world's 50 best and Asia's 50 best, it does really help to bring across the idea that we are a robust and genuine organization in this space because the chefs do recognize, you know, these are the brands. We also work with a lot of NGOs like WWF in Hong Kong. They helped us to launch here, which is great. And um, we're also working with some universities to, to make sure that our research is robust as well, such as Hong Kong U, Hong Kong UST. We're working with some service design master students to understand how we can use behavioral science to improve the advice we're giving on our toolkit. That's really interesting. And honestly, I have to say, Heidi, with the master's in food policy, I couldn't think of a, a better career path. I mean, that, it just sounds like it was custom made for you. Yeah, it does feel like that now. But I have to say, for you know, quite a few years, I struggled with what I was going to do. And I can tell you for sure that I never thought I would be here today, you know, doing this podcast with you and talking about Food Made Good as the CEO, um, it hasn't been an easy journey, I will say that. And I, I think that's because, you know, you mentioned earlier on about the training spouse. Uh, when you put your family first, which is what I did, you all your efforts and energy goes, goes in that direction. So studying, it really gave me some direction for myself and an opportunity to pivot in a different direction. It's, it's one of the the most exciting things that I could not want to do anything else. Absolutely. It's a perfect fit and I'm loving every day. I wake up every day with a reason to go to work. And restaurants are such an important part of the tourism experience. I mean, obviously, we look at food tourism, so people traveling for good food and drink or, or unique and memorable food or drink experiences. And people always point the finger to restaurants as being the most obvious way to do that. But I think that clearly what you're doing with the sustainability focus, I mean, people, they, we take our behaviors on the road with us. And so many countries now are obsessed with the sustainable practices in every aspect of what we do, whether it's the food and beverage packaging waste, whether it's how the, uh, you know, the ethical sourcing of animals, the ethical treatment of animals and so on, the rise in vegetarianism and veganism. And to really have your finger on the pulse of what's happening. I mean, in, in many ways, you're, you're kind of, you're at the entry point for food tourism, but you're also having your fingers on the pulse of the trends in the industry. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting place to be in right now. Yeah. And I think the, for, it's definitely been much easier for us in Hong Kong because we, you know, it's a new program here, but imagine 10 years ago when, you know, the SRA started in London, it was very much an educational piece and what they were doing and it's taken them uh, it took them much longer than it will for me because 
these kind of issues have sort of caught up, if you like, with uh, what people are interested in. And for sure, the Gen Zs and the millennials have a big role in this. They're much more um, educated on the issues. They see it all over their Instagram feed, all over their social media all the time, the issues that are going on. So we're just really excited to be starting this at this time. Um, you talked about the rise in vegetarianism and veganism it, that's just been phenomenal that that was where a lot of my research was um had started this kind of interest in seeing this trend of all of these alternatives coming out in the market and this was back in 2013 and 14 it was just phenomenal the rise of this and i could see it happening before me so by the time it reached restaurants it it was kind of a no-brainer of course restaurants and chefs need to be looking at this space and uh, chefs get their inspiration from what's going on in social media as well. But what about the sort of culinary education piece? Uh, and that's a very interesting space as well. So because we take a systems approach, we try to look at the root of how we can help our restaurant members and chefs understand the trends. Hopefully this is not going to be just a trend. We don't say that we are all trying to be vegetarians or you know, start eating vegan. We know it's only roughly 3% of the world identify as vegetarian, but you've got many more identifying as flexitarian, the idea that you eat less animal-derived produce on a default basis. So we're sort of trying to meet in the middle and encourage less meat, not no meat, but less meat and more plant-based. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. We're very lucky to be doing this now uh, will have less of a struggle than they did. The, the SRE really paved the way in this space, sort of connecting the sustainability uh, with you identifying chefs and restaurants and saying this is the group that we need to work with in order to get sustainability moving. And I absolutely agree because we have so many more people in the world um, eating out, and the trends are that you know as countries become wealthier. Uh, they will spend more money on eating out. So I think working with chefs is really the place to be on this, sub on this subject. Heidi, on a more topical note, can you tell us about how the protests and the more recent COVID outbreak has posed challenges to the work you're doing and to you personally? Yeah, it's been uh, an unprecedented time, but we did launch during the protests, so we knew that we were in, you know, operating and launching it in quite a scary time, but we didn't want to wait. So we, even the launch was, we were having a plan B and worried that it might not happen, but luckily we managed to, to launch and that was pretty successful considering we were only going to, we we're only expecting 50 people and we had doubled that, 100 turned up. So it was fantastic because you always worry that you'll be standing in front of an empty stage when you introduce the program. But the interest is definitely here. And now I think with COVID-19, for sure, it's, it's come to an almost a halt. So the way we've adapted is uh, we do these sustainability breakfasts, uh, something I didn't mention about the services, actually. And this is unique to Hong Kong because it's, the, it's an initiative that uh, I started here. We, we want to have these monthly gatherings so that our members can meet face to face so that it's not, not everything is digital because it's also a community that we're trying to create and networking. So with the breakfast, we had, yes, a January one and our March one were face-to-face um, -face in our restaurants. So a couple of restaurants had uh, uh, kindly sponsored those. And then the February one we had postponed. Now, because of what's happening, we're having to adapt. And so we're doing that online. So that will take place um, on Tuesday, actually, for the first time. So a little bit scary because we haven't had any formal training on how to run a live webinar, but we're hoping it will go smoothly. Yeah, it's about adapting, I suppose. You have to adapt and provide more um, of your services online. So we'll, we'll take this online. We've got about 15 members signed up. We expect to have 25 by Tuesday. And we'll see how it goes. But for sure, we're thinking about how, how can we sort of be agile and, and keep thinking of new ways to operate. One of the things that we're advising our industry to do right now in terms of coping is to go back and focus on strengthening relationships. I think that at the normal pace of business, we get so busy 
and sometimes we forget about the people who are mo most important to us. And now when people are literally stuck at home with nothing else to do, people are going back to to people they haven't talked to in 10 years, say, and say, oh, you know, let's, let's catch up. And I, I think that at least for, for our stakeholders, that's an important thing to be focusing on now. Would you say that's true as well for, for your life and, and business in Hong Kong, or, or are you experiencing something a little different? I think, uh, of course, re the relationships and holding them strong and keeping them near is very important. But because it's so it's sink or swim here in Hong Kong, the rents are so high, people are really just surviving. So even though we have re we continue to reach out as well to sort of the larger organizations and ask them to take this opportunity to sort of take stock of things. It's a quiet time. Can you start to do the things that you had intended to do that you haven't had time to do such as rethink what kind of packaging you're using is it a good time to look at your operations see how you can reduce your food waste um, take stock um, i think it's very much businesses a lot of the restaurants have been just trying to survive and um, many of our members have uh, closed temporarily in light of what's happened and because of uh, Carrie Lam's announcement that she might uh, stop the sale of alcohol, which I, I think that's not going to happen anymore, but th that she wanted restaurants and bars to temporarily close. Uh, but the restaurants have taken it into their own hands and said, we'll close because we don't want to um, have any cases of COVID-19. So they've been also adapting, which is great. They, Especially for the high end, you know, who are not, they don't really like to do delivery well they've started to do that now some of the restaurants so, so they're really adapting to survive and trying to keep some form of income coming in uh, of course they're really in survival mode i would say but yes relationships uh, i think for the restaurants that can't keep their staff they, they try to do something for them whether it's whether it's a, sort of a reduced pay packet or taking some unpaid leave and come back but it's so unpredictable right now. Yeah, I would say it really survival is is a uh, is top of mind. So kind of related to relationships is the idea of integrity. And when we were talking earlier, you said that your number one pet peeve in business was a lack of integrity. And that's something that I agree with 100%. I mean, I cannot stand people who don't uphold their promises. <laughs> so <laughs> how did you how did you arrive at that specific pet peeve? Because that's, that's a pretty specific pet peeve to have. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, Hong Kong has a lot of, there's been, a, there are a few organizations that are, are working sort of in this space in sustainability generally, and a few that are, yeah, they want to consider themselves sort of leading because they've been doing it for a while. And I think, you know, what I tend to do is kind of open up everything, what I'm doing. This is, this is my model. This is what I'm doing. But later to find out that a certain person or certain organization was trying to sort of copy certain parts of your your what you're trying to do it's really um it's really unethical it really disappoints me you know so i think i have to just be a little bit more careful with holding back some ideas perhaps or, or the material that we share and hong kong is a little bit dog eat dog you know my staff always say to me Heidi, before you take on a project with others ask what do they want from you you know it's very much like this so uh, me coming from sort of a slightly NGO background um, and then trying to work with some corporates as well. Uh, I think it's really that difference as well, like the organizations you work with and, and certain people you work with, you just have to be always asking this. And maybe it's a Hong Kong thing, I think, or you know, maybe this is what it is in business, but I tend to first give people the benefit of the doubt when I meet them uh, or just be an open book and not sort of be negative and, and be skeptical. I definitely want to share rather than hold back. Is that what you meant by wearing your heart on your sleeve gets you into trouble, Heidi? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you have to know what you have to keep to yourself, perhaps. Knowing what you know now, Heidi, what advice would you have given a younger version of yourself? It is quite therapeutic talking about this. I think just being patient, as I mentioned earlier on, being a 
trailing spouse. You just put your family first and your career second. In the last sort of the the last the five years previous to having to coming to this food make good project, I, I for sure I was not putting myself first and not really knowing that I would be doing this. So yeah, having patience and believing if you really are passionate about a subject and area, just go for it and find ways to get there. You know, you don't have to have a great job. Uh, you don't have to have a paid job even in the area. You can still work in your space by volunteering, by offering your time in many different ways. I remember when I was in Amsterdam, I was working, um, I was on the food committee for the school, for my children's school. And that was really satisfying. You get to work with different organizations, different parts of the school. So it, it really taught me that you don't have to be necessarily in a paid job in that space to feel like you're working in the space. So yeah, definitely be patient and, and study hard. Studying for sure is a, a quick way to get, well, not necessarily quick, but a great way to get in. And, and then you're you're, you get into the space in a way that is believable and uh, strong and robust rather than kind of fluffy, I guess, which is what I had been doing before I started studying. You know, I think uh, also studying later in life is, is really important. People think you have to go the regular route to university at 20. And then, yeah, probably now with the millenn millennials and, and doing so much online, people are changing jobs. But it wasn't like this, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think um, that I do, you know, change different, um, go in different directions the way I have eventually done, starting off with sort of English teaching and then doing marketing for the British Council and then doing this. So my, studying is really a fantastic way. You've got to find the right course, though because I had done a lot of shorter courses that were not right for me. But that's what going for a university course does. It really helps you to find the genuine sources of uh, and the right data and the right things to read. Speaking of later in life, Heidi, is there a legacy that you'd like to leave behind? Because we're in Hong Kong, I'm going to focus on Hong Kong. Um, have Normalizing food sustainability would be great. So right now, operating not sustainably is the norm but if we could flip that and restaurants were emphasizing more on what we consider sustainable you know the three pillars societal issues sourcing issues and environmental issues if if this was the norm that would be fantastic but i know it's a long slog it's going to be quite hard work to get there i actually have written a food vision so that's one thing that i'm really excited to talk about actually or at least just mention is that a couple of weeks ago we were told that we are semi-finalists in the Rockefeller Foundation Food Vision Prize and in there I actually described what the food system would look like by 2050 if things went well so it was uh, talking about the normalization of operating sustainably so rather than conventional farming practices be the norm you might have regenerative or organic farming as the norm. So things were flipped, if you see what I mean. So basically through your work that you hope to make a lasting impact on the food systems that are evolving that our children will be enjoying. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be thinking long-term, leaving a space that for future generations that they can enjoy things that we and the generations before us mm. have. Just simple things, fresh air, fresh water, um, not paying a premium for good food. This, this sort of, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. We have a similar perspective, but for us, I think we want to make sure that culinary cultures are preserved because we see so much homogenization in food service and food manufacturing production and export. And that really stresses us out because it's people's food and drink that is really what makes so many places around the world so unique and so worth visiting. How do you feel about that? Because for us, it's an ongoing concern and we don't necessarily see things getting better anytime soon. Yeah, it's very tricky because obviously um, certain food sectors uh, are very 
powerful and strong. If you look at meat, for example, lobbying around that, um, very powerful lobbies that like to keep things the way they are. What we like to advise our chefs about is the idea of sourcing biodiverse ingredients. And I think that connects quite nicely to uh, what you do in food tourism, because um, by protecting heritage products, for example, like meat, you can really um, sort of hit, have a win-win. You learn about something that has, is not the norm, is not common, um, is very special. Um, and at the same time, you can help to preserve the, the livelihoods of those uh, farmers working in, in that area. I like to talk about the work of um, the Chef's Manifesto. I'm not sure if you know about them, but they're really trying to uh, help bring about the issues of us losing our diverse ingredients. They've worked with Knorr on a future 50 report where they highlight 50 ingredients that we should try to use more of. I don't know if you're aware that although there are about 30,000 plant species in the world, we actually only consume 150 to 200. I read that. And that is just mind-blowing when you think about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and these are not the things that you, you hear about unless you kind of dig deep into the research yeah. or like me, I'm very much obsessed with what's going on in this space um, just because of this, my studies that it's not common knowledge so we need to highlight these facts if you go onto the sdg to advocacyhub.org website you can find some really wonderful illustrations of these issues that we can share widely another very interesting fact is that 60 percent of our global calories come from just four plants you know it, it is such a shame and and it's become that way because they are high yielding from different parts of the world so rice more from asia potato from the west and in south america and so on so you when you learn about these these stats it's mind-boggling so we say to the chefs can you serve more biodiverse ingredients can you look for those special ingredients and sort of excite your diners um through unknown ingredients or ingredients that we need to highlight more of and this is great for reducing the reliance on monocropping as i said earlier on what you have with farms that just grow the same ingredients over and over and over they just don't help the soils at all because what you need is this kind of rotation and uh, pulses and and cows that are a great one pulses actually fix nitrogen to the soil so you've got ingredients that can help on both sides not just to consume and eat but also great for soils and then if you swap that out in year two and have your cows graze on it, then that's great too. So we're talking about trying to um, normalize eating a wide variety of foods and, and reduce the reliance on just a few. Heidi, you are so passionate about food sustainability. I wanted to ask, what are some of the ways you are encouraging that at home when you cook with the children or your family? You know, What are some of your favorite sustainable foods to eat and make at home? Yeah, that's a really tough one. And even though I am, as you say, very passionate about this area, getting kids interested, well, my kids anyway, I better not generalize here, is quite tricky. And we have very interesting conversations at home because my partner um, very much enjoys his meat. With the kids, it's not easy. But we, you know, we started off doing things like Green Monday, so kind of a meatless Monday, There's little tricks of uh, replacing potato in your um let's say your shepherd's pie with some cauliflower um, trying to introduce some alternative meats like you know your omni pork which is a replacement for um for mince pork and the beyond burgers and, and so forth but um I, it's definitely not easy and my kids are a little bit older now so they're 13 10 and 9 uh, my youngest is is very much into experimenting and eating different foods, so I kind of rely on her to try new ones. But it's the old kind of usual typical tips that mums try to hide things in the sauces. And, you know, they say it takes 20 attempts to get kids to eat something before they might like it. So I don't have a silver bullet for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Do you have a favorite food that you'd like to share with us? I I love food, of course. In the end, I just chose, chose a very traditional dish, and that is the Sunday roast. Yeah, I, I really savor having that 
but you can't have too much too often because it's not necessarily uh, the healthiest or the most sustainable. But yeah, just a traditional kind of roast chicken with really excellent roast potatoes and a great gravy and some green veg is perfect. Yeah, very classical. Well, that Sunday roast concept was something that was new to me when I moved to the UK. It's, it's you know, for us, that's basically Thanksgiving dinner in the United States, yeah. but they're doing yeah. it every week here in the UK. And I was just, it was kind of mind boggling that every Sunday people would get together and have this massive plate of food where, you know, the food was falling over the side and the gravy was running off the side. And and it was just, it was, of course, way too many vegetables for an American because we don't normally like our vegetables. <laughs> but yeah. um, then, of course, I got used to it. So uh, so I have to ask you, are you more of the soft potato or the crispy potato person? Oh, my gosh. Crispy, of course. Of course, um, yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think you have to, uh, you parboil and then you put them in very hot oil and that's how you get them crispy i'm not an expert but i know what i like so yeah it's for sure crispy we're always fighting over crispy parts in our family whether it's potatoes or a pie or anything we always all want the crispiest parts well heidi if we ever get into a situation where i can cook for you i will make you my famous potatoes but i can't give you the recipe oh, now because it's wow a secret. i might even travel for that <laughs> <laughs> i might even come to you for that so you're based uh, in the uk yes yes outside london Right. Nice. Well, Heidi, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you today. Just listening to your voice and hearing some of your stories about Hong Kong reminds me of the time that I spent walking around the streets there. I, I've uh, been there a few times and I, it is one of the best food cities in the world. So you're very lucky to be living there. And I only look forward to the time when we can all go out to eat again, given the current climate. So uh, Heidi, thank you again for sharing your thoughts and your uh, your experience with our audience today. We really appreciate it. Thank you both for allowing me to have this platform to talk about uh, food and sustainability. Thanks for listening today. The Eat Well, Travel Better podcast is brought to you by the World Food Travel Association, the world's leading authority on food and beverage tourism. Our mission is to preserve and promote culinary cultures through hospitality and travel. By doing so, we empower local communities and entrepreneurs with the knowledge and tools needed to reach new food lovers and gain a competitive edge. Founded in 2003, now each year we shepherd a community of 200,000 professionals in more than 100 countries. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And you can learn more about us, subscribe to our newsletter, and join our family at worldfoodtravel.org. Until next time, eat well and travel better.